go. Um, so, I'm going to start. My name is Emma. I work at YG Kennedy. I'm our director. I work on the key there. Um, I actually went to school here for about a year, like in 2010 or 2011. I went to read college first for a religion, and then I was like, oh my god, I need a job. <laughs> so I went to school here for like a year. Um, I, saved I remember these presentations used to be in the annex. Okay, so um, I didn't really totally know exactly what the kind of things that people talk about are necessarily, but I thought I'd tell you about 10 things that I think are important in the creative process. They're very personal things. Everyone's process is different. Um, I guess I'll lead into it by saying, at Widen and Kennedy, I am an art director, so I work with a copywriter. I have a partner named Shorty. Um, and we work on briefs for Nike, where we um, give, they give us a problem to solve, they give us a sneaker, they give us an athlete, they give us an event, they give us something to do, and we have to come up with ideas on how to solve that problem. Usually commercials and things like that are campaigns. Um, and my job is to come up with ideas. Um, and then I work with you know, designers and editors and directors and that kind of thing to execute those ideas. So I come up with an idea. So, uh, starting with, I get a brief, and they're like, okay, well, we want you to do something for LeBron for his new shoe in 2016, and uh, you have exactly a week to think of what it is, and we're going to check in in two days. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, so what's the first thing I do? I get anxiety. <laughs> um, anxiety is a very important part of the creative process, and I think it doesn't get its just desserts or you know, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't get enough attention. I think people think that the better you get, the less anxiety you'll get. And that's probably true, but anxiety is really important. Um, I think it kind of is normal and necessary, and people freak out if they have it, and they think they're not going to get anything done, but they usually do. Um, actually, I'll play a little video. I made this for at, um, there was, yes, Good Nervous. Uh, thank you. Um, they asked us to make a presentation or a video or something about when you get nervous when you're working. So I made this video um, a couple months ago. Hang on. Oops. Shit, that's the next slide. <laughs> 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 this is a inquiry. So I'm going to do a video and I talk about what I like to do so that it's about the, what is it? It's, what does the email say? How are you getting <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that does make me nervous, I think I have to do everything. I'm going to have to do this, I'm going to have to do this. And honestly, work does not make me good nervous. I'm nervous constantly. I actually read a lot of self help. That's why I eat so much popcorn. It's stressy. The carrot sticks with hot sauce and eat and work and eat and work. The process of watching me talk about it, she shouldn't do it. I mean, it really makes me nervous. Yeah, I was really nervous. That's like my thing. Do you not think I'm funny? I think this is funny. I'm really gonna hate this. It's really gonna be awful. This is just terrible, you guys. I'm really uncomfortable. I think I'm gonna be awful. I feel a little less nervous now. Okay, I hate nervous again. I'm excited when something's over. Nothing's forever. I mean, I'm hoping that something good comes out of this. I mean, I'm glad that I'm doing it. Um. <laughs> Oops. FYI, I did a lot of funky embedding into this presentation, so I don't know. I don't know if I need this microphone. Can you guys hear me if I'm just talking? Okay. Um, yeah. So anyway, yeah, anxiety is important. I think it's normal, and if you don't have anxiety, there's probably that's going on. You're not challenging yourself enough, maybe. You know, you're not putting yourself into more interesting or precarious situations with work. Um, so yes, the first thing that happens to me is I get anxious. Uh, and then what happens after I get anxious? I have a snack. Because <laughs> <laughs> I usually need to distract myself with lots of snacks at work. I'm kind of compulsively eating popcorn and carrot sticks, that kind of thing. 
Um, and it's you know not necessarily the healthiest thing in the world, but it's just part of my process. And everyone should find snacks that they like because sometimes when you're working, you forget to eat something. And this happens a lot with my partner, Jordan. Have you eaten anything today? And I was like, oh, I've only eaten, you know, popcorn since noon. Um, you know, you got to eat lunch. So it's important to fuel yourself and remember to eat and take care of yourself while you're doing work. So what happens after uh, you're anxious and then you have snacks? You complain to your friends about how anxious <laughs> and how full you are. Because <laughs> friendship is a really important part of the creative process. Um, you can't really see it because this is sort of full now, but on the top left is me and that's Jordan. She's my copywriter partner. Um, my other friends, he's my friend's dog, my other friend Laura. This is me and my friend Justin Morris. He did a presentation here a little while ago. So we, we're not really friends, but you know, <laughs> it's, good. Um, it's also important to surround yourself with people who are creative friends too, because then you can ask them for advice and you can. Show them what you're working on and get their opinion and, and that kind of thing. Um, I think I rely on my friends to help me and tolerate me and inspire me more than I probably rely on other things like looking at things on the internet or whatever. Like I think interacting and collaborating with people is super important and being open to what people think, not hiding anything, which is something I had to learn to do as an art director. Uh, you really have to get over the fear of putting your ideas in front of people because my job is basically come up with tons of ideas and have them all killed immediately. You know, whether because they're bad or they've already seen them before or whatever. Um, you have to get used to being like, what about this or what about this? And doing that with friends is a great way to kind of get over that fear. So um, now that you are full of anxiety, snacks, and friendship, you have to, and this is all sort of leading up to actually getting work done. This is all what happens to me before I do any work. Um, I go to the gym. <laughs> uh, because when you're working, you really need to take some time to sometimes stuff your brain full of information and then get some exercise because sometimes you think of things when you're least expecting it. Um, and getting exercise is really important. Um, and actually, this is a video that I made recently, um, which is going to link to the YouTube. And it's, I don't know if you guys know that song, Tarzan Boy like an 80s kind of hit. No. Well, let's see. Oh, how do I connect to the internet in here? I forgot to do that. Is there an internet Wi-Fi? Yes. Okay, so this is a video I made a few months ago, and it really annoyed my coworkers because I was playing this song over and over again. But it was inspired by driving my car one day, um, listening to this song, and I looked over into a Tai Chi studio, and people were just doing Tai Chi, and it just matched up really well with the song, so I made this little video. Hopefully, <laughs> anyone knows this song. But pretty much just people doing Tai Chi. <laughs> It was in Beverly Hills Ninja, probably in his famous cameo. He's like swinging on the palm tree before he flies into the building to save the princess. <laughs> so if you want to watch it, it's on YouTube. Okay. 
So the point of that, believe it or not, is that it's very important to get some exercise while you're working because sitting, your bodies aren't meant to just sit constantly and think of things. It's weird that we've kind of evolved to do these jobs just sitting there. Um, I think that moving your body is a really good way of making your brain work. And sometimes you think of much better things when you're not thinking about work and you're exercising and then you come back to it. I mean, it doesn't have to be like exercising, you know, like just going for a walk or you know, some people like hiking. I like riding horses. Um, or also water. Drink a lot of water. It kind of forces you to get up too because then you have to go pee all the time. Um, so after you uh, break a sweat, that's usually, and this is all before actually starting any work, um, you need some me time, uh, which is really difficult. Um, I've only learned it, oh, actually, wait, I have this cool thing. Okay. Oh, it only plays it from here, but it's some nice relaxing music. <laughs> Um, me time is very important. Uh, I think it's really easy to only focus on work and not focus on yourself. And it's kind of counterintuitive, but the more you allow yourself to feel healthy, um, the better your work will probably be. Um, burning yourself out isn't a great way to get anything done, and it kind of just makes you angry at yourself and the people you're working with. Um, so I started meditating. I have a, it's really easy these days. I have an app. Headspace, it's great. You like Headspace? It's great. It's just like you can't, there's no excuses anymore for not like, you know, doing nice things for yourself. You can even download like a gong if you want a gong noise at the end of your meditation. Um, but it's hard, you know, self love is a bitch. That's a name plate sculpture I made um, from a art show I did several years ago. It's about six or seven feet wide. It's really big. Um, and it was about how. I'm from New York City, and it's kind of an intrinsically not relaxed place. Um, and when I go back there, since I don't live there anymore, I always feel like I'm on vacation. And so it's always a challenge for me to try to relax in a place that I grew up. And to me, nameplate necklaces are very intrinsically tied to the culture of New York, you know. Um, I usually wear one all the time at the project. So anyway, yeah, me time is very important, I think. Uh, are you getting relaxed? It's really nice. <laughs> Um, okay. Oops. Now let's see how to stop the me time. There we go. Oops. As you can see, embedding in the line presentation. I was a designer, but not for that long. <laughs> before I became, oh yeah, I was a designer at Widen and Kennedy before I became an art director. I was a designer there for maybe like a year and a half, and then I became an art director. Um, next thing that's important are doing your taxes, because once you're rejuvenated and you've gone to the gym and you feel really productive, it's time to do something that has nothing to do with working, but you're feeling really productive and at least get this out of the way. You really do have to do it. There you go. Like Ten minutes before this happens. That's great. <laughs> really important. This is my friend Nicole, uh, Nicole Lavelle. She actually started the Friends of Graphic Design program a really long time ago, um, and she can attest to the fact that she swears hiring someone last year saved her so much stress. That's my first accountant, um, who's a guy from Jersey who I don't recommend hiring. I've since improved. I'm pretty sure he was doing lots of things illegally, but I, you know, was still proud of myself for getting a first accountant in any way. It makes things a lot easier, and it's like not that expensive. And if you're doing freelance design, you got to keep, you got to save your receipts, you got to save your, you know, invoices, and you can expense a lot of things. Um, that you can't necessarily if you're full time. So it's really helpful to have an accountant, hopefully a good one, if not criminal, that can help you deduct all those things. So anyway, do your taxes. So once you do your taxes, you start to actually start to do some work. Um, which I usually like to not look at the internet. Um, I think it's really important. I think the internet is an incredible resource. I think you have things at your finger fingertips. You know, you can pretty much Google anything you want. I mean, you know, design inspiration is a great place to go if you can't remember how what a layout looks like and you just need one really quickly. You know, to remind yourself. Um, but you know, realistically, it's kind of a wormhole that's sort of it's very cyclical and it kind of reproduces itself. And people like the same things a lot, and it, it sort of perpetuates trends that I think you get you stuck in thinking there's only one way to do something. 
Um, so you really got to get out and, and look at other media and culture. Um, like I'm a really big fan of movies. Um, I love movies from the 80s. Repo Man, great movie. Falling Down, also a great movie. Um, this is a librarian. You should go to the library. I just got a library card. It's really great. Um, I am currently reading a book called Black Gods of the Asphalt, which is about religion and street basketball culture, um, which is really interesting because I work on basketball a lot at work, and I've had to teach myself a lot about basketball. And being able to read a book about it as opposed to just like looking at what Nike's already done or what people, you know, it's like you've got to saturate your brain with information that's different than what's already out there. So you can kind of come at things from left field. Um, books, going to the museum, looking at artists that you like. This is John Baldessari, he's one of my favorite artists. Um, I mean, you can go to the go to Goodwill and just get art books and just have so many resources. And, and when you look at them, and I, sometimes I have these books that are from like 1983, and it's just people are doing now. And they're calling it new, but it's really something that happened already, like 30 years ago. You just got to find it, and you know, inspire yourself, with not just the internet. Also, I think there's a lot of research on like when you look at a screen, your brain processes things a certain way, whereas if you're looking at the like, tactile, it's very different the experience. Um, and it kind of gives your brain a chance. Also, I think my idea coming up with process is. I fill my brain with lots of information, and then you kind of have to let it percolate and relax a little bit, and things will kind of connect themselves. You know? <coughs> um, I think. Anyway. So yeah, not the internet. Um, so uh, once you have things that are not the internet, you can kind of take things that have nothing to do with each other and put them together, and then hopefully come up with something more interesting than something that's predictable. For example, do you guys remember the Nene dance that was popular like maybe four or five years ago? Is that the name? No? No? Yeah. Okay, anyway. Um, <laughs> there was also a really great viral video going around of these goats that were jumping on a piece of metal. So me and my uh, buddy Justin, what's up? I said open this. Yeah, me and my buddy Justin put together this video, um, which really made no sense, but it was great. And it's the only thing that I've ever done that has maybe kind of gone viral having like 3,500 views. But this is it, I'll show it to you. basketball, for example, like Jordan, my partner, she um, knows a lot about sports. She knows a lot about basketball. She knows a lot about, um, she just grew up with it, you know? Um, I didn't. And uh, so I come at things from kind of the outsider's perspective. I've learned a lot about basketball. I can like a couple of conversations about it now. I have like players I like and that kind of thing. But she really knows it very like deeply. Um, so she comes at it where she knows the, the rules and she knows the cultural aspects of it. And I come at it where it's like, well, what if we just combine it with some ice cream trucks? You know? And then you're kind of like, well, you got it. You know, so when you, you have something like that, she kind of vet checks it to make sure it relates to basketball authentically. Because it has my work it has to very it has to be very authentically about basketball, but it has to come to something that's left field enough that it's surprising. Because we want to surprise people with new ways of understanding, you know, whatever it is we're doing. Um, so, for example, goats and you know, nene dance. Who would have thought? Um, does that make sense? Everyone good? Just nodding. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, so, after you've got some tension and you try things that don't necessarily work well together to see what happens, 
you wind up having to wing it um, while still working really hard at the same time. Um, so this is a still well, it's a key image, I guess, from the first commercial that I ever made, um, which was a LeBron ad that came out several years ago. Um, and I was working as a designer, but I wanted to be an art director. So me and Jordan got together. She was a copywriter. She had a partner. We got together. We decided to pitch ideas for this LeBron brief, where when he went back to Cleveland, I don't know if you guys are basketball fans, but he went back to Cleveland a few years ago from Miami, and it was this big deal. And he was like, you know, everyone was really mad when he left Cleveland. and. Cleveland had never won a championship in like 50 years, and he was, I'm, I'm going back to Cleveland, and I'm going to win it for the everyone, walk we'll together. Because um, that was this, and sort of the brief was, okay, we want to commemorate LeBron going back to Cleveland, and he's going to do it with the whole city behind him. Um, so we pitched an idea that everyone gets in the huddle with LeBron for the first game, um, and it sold, and I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. I literally did not know what it mean, meant to be an art director. I think I only wanted to do it because they said I couldn't, and I thought that was a really good challenge. So I wound up going on production, um, and I <laughs> the first flight that we took to go to Cleveland, I got so nervous on the airplane, I left. I got off the airplane because there was something <laughs> mechanically wrong with it they were tending to, which I'm sure was nothing important, but I was so anxious. I was, and I was like, there was a baby crying next to me, and I was sitting in the back of the plane, and I was like having a hot flash, and you know, they're fixing something, and I had to get off the plane. I had to get off, and I had to take a, a later flight, um, which, you know, I'm like, you know, got my rolly luggage, and I'm walking past all my coworkers. Um, and they're like, so where are you going? And I'm like, I just, I gotta, I'll see you in Minneapolis. Um, I, I felt a lot better later when I heard the ECD at my at Wyden. Joe Staples also has a fear of flying, and he's done the same thing. So I was like, oh, okay, well, that's not so embarrassing. Well, it's still embarrassing, but at least there's like, com you know, camaraderie in it. Anyway, so this was my first commercial, and I was seriously winging it. I had a lot of really good mentors and a lot of really good help. It's really important, especially when you first start, to be able to learn from people and surround yourself with people that you admire and to listen to them. I was so intent on proving myself that it was a, it was a very difficult challenge for me, although I had to do it, to open myself up to just saying, how do I do this? I have no idea what I'm doing. What would you do? And just really learning and listening and taking tips and not pretending like I had any idea what I was doing because I really didn't and there was too much at stake. You know, it was just like, it was a big project. Um, so I'm going to play this for you guys. the first commercial I 
made, which I'm sure you can imagine was extremely stressful. <laughs> um, the brief was about bringing LeBron back and commemorating that. Nike literally wanted it to feel like it was a historical moment. They actually compared it to the man landing on the moon. And like, oh, okay. Like, <laughs> he's landing in Cleveland, you know? It's not the moon. Um, and so we treated it to look like, you know, I don't know if you guys like Robert Frank, um, the old photographer who shot a lot of stuff in the, um, in the civil rights movement and that kind of thing um, earlier. Um, black and white, very time life kind of photography. So it was inspired by that, like very early time life photography that was sort of back in a time when, you know, when you got a photograph in Time Life magazine, that was your window into the world, into this like human event, you know. Um, we're trying to weave this into the story of like human history. Um, and then it was also this particular, the image of the puddle was actually inspired by a photograph my mom took in the 70s at uh, LaGuardia Airport in New York, which was actually back then Idlewild Airport. It was at a this thing called a Love In, which uh, was basically a giant, people were just in a big circle, like a huge crowd of people saying home together. And it was like a peace protest for the Vietnam War. Um, and I should have put that picture in there. But it was basically a similar picture where there was one guy in the middle and there were all these people around him. And it was really beautiful. And that sort of inspired this, which this photograph was really difficult to get on the production. We had, I wanted to get it, but this photography is always a weird afterthought. And so I literally had to just bring in a gigantic ladder. Everyone was huddled around LeBron. I had to send the photographer up the ladder. I didn't have a, a, like a connection to what he was shooting. Normally, there's something that connects his camera to, so I can see what he's shooting. And I can be like, oh, go to the left, go to the right, whatever. There wasn't that. So he basically just went up there and blindly just started taking pictures. And I just crossed my fingers. And hopefully, one of them would be right. Um, and he got one that was pretty good. Um, so what happens after you wing it brings me to my last slide is the moral of the story. Oops. <laughs> that shouldn't be behind there. <laughs> the moral of the story is double check your presentation. It says patience um, because you really have to have patience with your process. One of the first things I, one of the hardest things for me to get over when I was learning to work um, was that and this is just also part of my character, is that I wanted everything to be done right away. And if I didn't have an idea right away, I was pretty convinced I was never going to come up with one. Um, but one thing I've learned just through practice is that my process is always pretty much the same, where I get really anxious, I sort of do everything else, then I stuff my brain full of information, and then I let it marinate, then I get some exercise, and I stuff my brain full of information, and then you know I sit down, and I work really hard, and then I get up again, and I'm like, you know, you kind of have to just let it unfold which is hard when you have deadlines and you have um, you know, clients and you have personal pressure. But it's counterintuitive, but putting more pressure on yourself usually isn't great for the creative process. You know, I think people think that when they, if they're not under pressure, they're not going to get anything done. But I think that's just kind of also a, a kind of a cultural American thing. I think you can get a lot done when you allow yourself the patience to see what happens. Um, sometimes it's difficult when you have deadlines and that kind of thing. but. Hopefully, you develop a work relationship with people where they allow you the freedom to, or some freedom to at least, smooth through your creative process to get the best work possible. Um, so what I'm going to play you now is basically the sequel to the film that you just saw. Um, speaking of patience, this was an ad we made for when the Cavaliers first went back to Cleveland for their first championship. Um, it was called a win ad. So basically, when Nike has a team doing something and there's a chance they could win, they make an ad for it that might not run if they lose. So we filmed this. We made it. It was ready to air, and they lost. So it didn't air. Um, and it was also they had never they hadn't won in since like 1950 something. It was like 50 years of a drought of never winning a championship in Cleveland. They were like the, their motto was "There's always next year." Um, which we then flipped actually for a bunch of print ads we did and said, there's always this year because we're kind of a reality and cry. Um, but then they won last year, right? Yeah, last year they won and the ad ran. So after two, you know, a year of me waiting and 50 years of them waiting, um, the ad did run. Um, 
which kind of shows you you don't have to have patience. based on the fact that when we did research, um, we wanted to sort of figure out how people react if they won. And we were looking like forums, like sports forums and people and stuff, and people really didn't, they literally would say like, if they won, we, I wouldn't know how to react, I'd be in shock. So that's kind of where the idea came from, that they win and no one knows what to do. Like they literally just have no idea how to celebrate their so used to losing. One thing I also wanted to mention was in that ad and the one before it, it's all Clevelanders. So all the people who were in, all the people we cast, um, are all from Cleveland, which was pretty amazing because in casting, like for this one, we literally were asking people like, how would you, to, to get their reaction, we were like, well in this film they have to react, and it's hard to get people who aren't actors, you know, we'd be like, okay, so what happens if the Cleveland Cavaliers win, and people would literally burst into tears in casting because they were so excited. The guy who has all the, power, the, the fan stuff around him, it's all his stuff. He brought it to casting in like some paper bags, you know. So I think there's kind of a, you know, I try to make an attempt working in something that's like very corporate and you know a lot of people are concerned with selling product and that kind of thing to try to try to do things that feel culturally important and relevant and impactful for the people that you're making them for you know as long as you're going to be a sellout you might as well try to make things that are you know there's someone out there that fan is now in his like i mean it just like made his lifetime you know he was the biggest cavaliers fan ever and now he's in the cavaliers win at he got to see a championship you know so that's kind of a nice thing. I think if you um, improve things from a position of improving them, if, when you're in when you're inside the system and make things better for people. I don't know. Anyway, uh, last slide is coming up. Thank you. <laughs> I did a lot of Googling and asking my IT guy how to like embed this presentation. So, yep, that's it. Any questions? So when you're art directing a commercial, mm -hmm. what, I guess specifically, like, what specifically are you doing? Are you directing how the shop look or? Like on the actual production? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, my boss, my bosses, they're the global creative directors for Nike. They basically taught me how to art direct. Um, and what they sort of instilled in me is my job as a creative is to guard the idea. Because a lot of what happens is you go to production and, you know, you have a director you hire to execute the idea. And you have, um, tons of people working on it and things are moving really quickly and there's tons of money at stake and there's just no time for anything. And sometimes the creative, you know, the, the director's vision, which is often very good, kind of maybe gets carried away or she gets carried away or loses sight of the idea. So my job is to make sure that whatever shots that we get execute the idea. So in that last one, for example, um, really all we needed were shots of people looking shocked. But our director, wanted people doing all sorts of different reactions and you know really emotive and all this different stuff and we were kind of like all right well this is all well and good thank you like maybe we'll use some of this stuff which I don't necessarily say that at the time but I have to sit there and you know be a nuisance and essentially say like okay can you get one of him just like looking shocked you know like I have to make sure we get the shot that we need um, which 
is difficult sometimes because you basically have to go up there and be like, we need this. You kind of have to be like, put your foot down. And then I've kind of just come to terms with, I am going to try my hardest to get the shots that we need in the best way that we can until my producer literally says, okay, I'm over like out of time. Yeah? So going to Ohio and being from Portland, that must have been a little, little bit of a shock for them. So how did you um, relate to that? How did you, uh, English, okay. Uh, <laughs> how did you convince them that you were not a threat to them? That well, your being wasn't a threat to their being? Well, I don't know that they thought we were a threat. I mean, any any time a production company goes into a city like Cleveland and they're like, we're going to make a Nike commercial, who wants in? You know, people are usually pretty excited about it. Um, I think, I don't know, the people who were in it were very excited about being in it. The people who were more hard to convince, honestly, are kind of the people in the world, you know, the people who look at it on the internet, the people who have no idea that, like, I mean, people looked at that video, the win ad one, and they were commenting on YouTube that the NBA was rigged because how could they possibly have known they were going to win? You know, like people are just loony. There was another, someone did a video of the first one, the huddle one. Someone spent 16 minutes on YouTube analyzing the uh, satanic implications of that video. <laughs> it was remarkable. Oh, like man. really just gung-ho, detailed about like the, 666 and LeBron and all this and they're just like it was crazy. I mean I was flattered, you know. I was like, oh, I really you should I emailed them and I'm like, thank you. I really appreciate it. I've thought about doing that, <laughs> but I'm that because I've had people troll videos and or think that I've stolen ideas and I've had my boss literally say, like, Emma, you just can't wrestle with the internet, you you're gonna lose. Um and uh actually the the, the huddle one, Jake or Jake, it's Jake. Drake um, copied it. I don't know if you saw his video that he made for that song Problems. I think it was Problems. But it was like him in a bunch of different costumes throughout the whole video. And he like referenced it in one scene, which was pretty cool. It's like gotten to the zeitgeist. Um, so yeah, I don't know. People are, I think just if you come at it with a certain amount of sincerity, which is hard in advertising, um, depends on where you work. Wyden tries to be a place that is sincere about the projects. It does, but it's difficult. You know, you're always stuck between the rock and a hard place of the client and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, and to get back to your question about my job is to get the right shots and also to make sure I'm so I'm the agency and so I sit behind the director and I have the director doing things and I comment if there's if need be. Then there's also the client there, um, the Nike client, and they come to me if they have a problem with a shot and then I have to either tell them, well that's why we're not doing it this way, or I have to go to the director and say the client wants this shot, can you get it? Um, and depending on your director, sometimes you have to comment more and sometimes you don't. You know, in theory, you're hiring a director you trust and you want them to work on it because they're very talented and because you want their vision. Um, and anytime you have to make a comment, it's really just to check a logistical box that maybe they haven't thought about or, you know, they're not getting or something like that. Um, and it's cool. You get to work with a lot of people that are really um, talented. Like, but with Nike, sometimes they don't always make it. Like I worked, I shot a whole bunch of commercials with Michelle Gondry last year, which was pretty amazing. I don't know if you guys like him, director. Um, and then they, they didn't air because Nike kind of fucked up some stuff and that just didn't happen, which is a weird thing to have to have, you know, shelve something but in the middle of production, but it's kind of the nature of the piece, I guess. Yeah. And more about how you got to Whiten, like where one of the people were, and that first video. Oh yeah, the worst video. Uh, have you guys seen the worst video? Um, do you want to show it? Do you want me to show it? I can show it. Great. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Since I turned off the overhead, of course. I had that feeling as soon as I did it. I'm like, ah, oh, she's gonna have something else cool to show. The worst video. It's so fun. Yeah. Well, and so embarrassing. Um. Well, but the thing, you're brave. I know. I'm you're really like a just brave did. human. Uh, FYI, this didn't get me into the program. Um, <laughs> where is the video? Uh, what is it called? WK12 is the video. Where is it? Oh, don't worry. I don't want to hold you up if you don't have it easy. No, I don't. It's here somewhere. I'm just here somewhere that. Oh, here it is. Um, so when I graduated from Reed and I went to uh, PSU for like a year, um, I started working at 
I was started doing freelance for the Ace Hotel. Um, that was kind of my first foray into design freelance. And then I became their first intern. Um, and while I was there, I decided to apply for the program at Wyden called WK12. Um, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, I really had no idea if anything was going on in advertising. I didn't even know what advertising was. And they had a prompt. The brief was like, uh, I don't remember what it was. It was like, do it, I don't know what it was. Probably do whatever you want. I don't remember. Um, but I decided to write them a song. So I wrote, because I play music also, I'm like in a band, and um, I had a keyboard, and I decided to write them a song, and I was like, oh, if I'm writing a song, i got to make a video, because, you know, can't have a song without a video. So I, at the time, was riding horses a lot. I had a horse. Um, so I, the day before it was due, which I had, if I had known they were going to extend the deadline, I wouldn't have necessarily told myself making this. Um, I made this video, which <laughs> they really liked, did not get me into the program, but that was for the best, because eventually I just started working there. Um, <laughs> and I'm glad I, I don't know. The, Program business. But they definitely noticed you. Yes, they definitely noticed me. I definitely got. <laughs> and I think that's an a important lot of, thing to think about. Yeah, personality and noticing. <laughs> yeah, and funny. just trying. You know, like yeah. I mean, that's really. I feel like the more if there is aside from patience and checking your presentation, you just really have to take risks. You know, and this to me was, I made it with a bunch of my friends too. You know, like I did something that was very much me. It was like with music. It was my my resources that I had, which were that I had some horses at my expense, and I had some, could buy some paint, and I had friends that were going to willing to spend an afternoon helping me in exchange for some pizza, and um, you know, then I edited myself in iMovie, which I did not know how to use, and you just really have to, I think when you really just throw yourself into a project or something like that, and you just say whatever happens, happens, you, you wind up coming up with a lot of stuff that you wouldn't have if you had really... I don't know, you just get something that's more genuine to yourself. So this is pretty genuine um, to me. Also, this is me maybe like five years ago, so I don't know if I would do this now, but it did it then, so that's kind of, yeah. I wish you could hear it more, but. shocking and I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do now, but the disappointment of that actually wound up sort of fueling me to do something else where I uh, I worked at the ACE and then after that I worked at Oma Chico for a while. Um, and after that I worked at an agency called Mutt. Um, and I worked at Mutt for a little under a year before there were some layoffs because we lost an account and I was laid off, which, you know, it happens. and. You think that it's the worst thing ever, but usually you wind up, especially in this industry, layoffs often mean you go somewhere else and you kind of move up or something like that. Because layoffs never sound as bad as getting fired. And I wasn't fired, FYI. Um, so, because literally that weekend, 
um, I got an email from John Jay at Wyden um, asking if I wanted to fill in for his designer who was out of town for like a month or two uh, when he used to still work there. And so I did that. Um, and there was also a plan at the time I had been talking to the studio about going and working up in the studio once that was over. So I started with John Jay. I branded that, um, you know, Green Zebra Grocery? Mm -hmm. I branded we that. that we just yeah. <laughs> and also another thing that I maybe would not have done now, I think it's really cheesy, but I, at the time, you know, thought it was cool and John Jay really liked, I don't know, it's funny, it's always funny when you're working for a client who you do something and you give them a bunch of options and maybe that they choose the one you don't really like and you're like, really, that one, that's the one you like? Because he would he sort of direct things that way. Um, he was interesting to work with. He was very much like, let's put it in a circle and see what we think. Okay, sure. So anyway, um, then I started working in the studio and did that for about a year and a half before. Mm -hmm. So you're at Wyden and then you decided you want to be an art director there. What was that process like? Were you just like pitching a bunch of ideas to different directors and like really trying to make them see your vision for it? And then did they just like end up giving you a chance or like how did that play out? Um, it's a, it was a difficult process. So the way that Wyden works, it's very compartmentalized. Um, studio is not a stepping stone to art direction. I think that people think that it's like being an art director at Wyden is the 2.0 of being a designer there, which it's not. They're very different jobs, which is not something I necessarily realized at the time. Um, I don't really do much design anymore. I freelance and you know outside of work just sometimes, but. Not at Wyden, really. I spend most of my time sitting on a Word document coming up with ideas. Um, but so the way it works is that you, as an art director or with a copywriter, you pitch ideas to your creative director. And so they had this, they knew I wanted to be an art director. I had sort of talked to some creative directors about it. And then one of them was laid off, the one who like wanted to maybe hire me. And I was like, oh, OK, so back to the drawing board. Um, and you kind of have to just talk to the different creative directors and see who's willing to give you an opportunity to work on something and teach you. And they're not all willing. Um, I talked to some that were like, mm, you're not, you know, you need you need to go to ad school. You need an ad, an art director portfolio. You, you're just you're a designer. And there's a lot of they think well, designers can't come up with ideas. Um, but then sometimes you come up to a creative director and they have a design background and they're like, I totally know. I, I did this too. So like, yeah, let's get you on this project and. Um, that was essentially what happened with my bosses. Um, they sort of knew I wanted to be an art director. They let me go on production for a Nike spot that was sort of already underway that was just shooting here in Portland. Um, and then when this project, the LeBron thing came around, they had been rebriefing it a lot. So they were kind of desperate for ideas, I think. So, I mean, we like to tell the story as we stole the brief because we sort of did. We like took the, we got a hold of the brief, Jordan emailed the creative directors because she was already working with them. She had started as a strategy intern actually and then she wrote a bunch of stuff um, and they were like, you're going to be a copywriter. She's like, okay. Um, and uh, she emailed them saying like, can Emma and I, you know, Emma from studio work on pitching some ideas just as an exercise. We don't, they're not have to be, we just want to learn. And they were like, the first email back was like, who's Emma? You know, <laughs> and then they were like, sure, why not? Um, and we were really telling ourselves we were just going to do this as an exercise, as practice, because we didn't want to psych ourselves out. And we barely knew each other. We certainly did not trust each other. I was completely, I had no idea. She was a sort of timid in terms of her writing. I was completely non trusting in terms of letting her write. So I was writing stuff. And it was just, we, it took a very long time for us to learn how to work together. Although I adore her now, and we have a really good working relationship. Um, and, uh, but the, the creative directors, what, what I realize now, looking back on it, is like they always took us very seriously. So even from the time when we were just pitching ideas for what we thought was fun and learning, they were taking us seriously. And you know, the day before the presentation, they just kept revising the work and kept bringing it back and kept asking us to change certain things and guiding us along. And then it was the day, you know, the day of the presentation, we were like, is this going in the deck? And they were like, yeah. We're like, oh my god. So then you know, we freaked out and then presented and then wound up you know, long story short, um, they rebriefed it again, but this time officially put us on it so that we weren't like sort of going behind everyone's backs. I even had, you know, I had a hard time getting the creative recruiters to want to um, put me in the creative department because they look for people with art director portfolios and that kind of thing. But there have been stories of people going from studio to becoming 
card directors. It's just harder. It's not an easier route. So because you were a designer and you wanted to be an art director and you had a good writer portfolio mm -hmm. and not an art director portfolio, how do you create an art director portfolio? portfolio? Because I'm an ad major and design minor, mm -hmm. but in school you end up designing a lot of your own ads. Mm -hmm. So it would look like both. Well, um, I had to basically make a portfolio as I was going along. So I was working in studio at the same time as I was art directing, um, and then what I would work on while I was art directing became my portfolio, because I didn't know how to make fake ads. You know, I knew I could come up with a lot of weird, wacky ideas just because I was like a, you know, I made a lot of art and did that kind of thing. But I didn't have like a classic ad portfolio, and. The same thing happened with Jordan when they wanted to make her a copywriter was that they kind of put her on some projects that maybe were led by other people, other, you know, more senior people, but enough that she could write some stuff and put it in her book and like make a book and be like, I wrote this stuff. So eventually once I made this one, um, I mean this one was a success, so it wasn't they, they eventually were like, we want to make you an art director, but in theory I would have put this in a portfolio. Um, I think a lot of people do spec work where they, they just ask to be on briefs or they just borrow the briefs and then like make work based on the brief. I think they wanted, at a place like Widen, they want to see that you can get a, a specific task and come up with ideas that solve that problem that are on the brief, which is one of the hardest things to figure out. Much less, I mean, coming up with an idea is a hard thing to figure out, like what's an idea, you know. Um, it took me a long time to learn what an idea was. And for me, personally, uh, I learned an idea to be something you can make. I think when I first started presenting, I would come up with a lot of sort of thoughts and feelings. It's like, oh, we should make people feel this way, or like get really people really excited about playing basketball and surprising everyone. And it's like those aren't ideas; they're feelings and sort of territories and thoughts. And but if I'm like, I want to make, um, you know, a commercial where everyone gets in the huddle, that's something you can actually make. It's like tangible, and that's how my my, my boss taught me to judge an idea is if you can make it. If I get too ethereal. Have to say, well, can I make this? You know, like, I want to make a bunch of posters that inspire kids to go play soccer. I can't make that, but I want to make a poster with a kid kicking a soccer ball to the moon and a headline about it saying, you know, something about her kicking the soccer ball to the moon. That's something I can actually make. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's more of an idea in that. Coming into an area of interest that you haven't, say, grown up with, such as basketball, what is most helpful in? Coming into that with fresh eyes and being able to do something nobody's ever done before in that, having not run up the Um Just that I guess you know you're willing to put things together that are surprising, you know. Um, because of previous detachment from that area, like that helps. Yeah, it sort of allows you not to regurgitate already what's already happening. You know, when I first started working on Nike. And I wanted to come up with an ad or an idea. I would look at a lot of Nike ads they already made because I thought, like, oh, I'll I'll look at the old ones and then I'll get an idea from that. But it never doesn't work, you know, because you're just they've already done it. It's not particularly inspiring. Um, you kind of maybe get an idea for what they would put, you know, what they would put into the world. But you you get a much better, a much fresher idea when you take some sort of elements of say basketball and you combine it with something that is different, you know. Something that is surprising, um, because then there's a truth about the game. Something anchors it in the, the, the game, and then there's something that is a new, a new way of looking at it, a fresh way of looking at it. You wouldn't have thought of. Well, that's all the time we have. So thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Um, and if you guys can sit around and help us change the room back, that would be really